a long, a long uh, direction shooting outward. It's usually to escape some sort of predator, or escape some sort of threat. Uh, and the other uh, suspected reason for mullet jumping like they do is to breathe oxygen rich air into a special organ that they have uh, towards the front there. They do swim in schools, which is why you see people out there with cast nets uh, trying to uh, trying to to get right out into the middle of that, uh, because when the mullet are running, as they say, uh, you can toss a cast net out there off of a dock or something, and you can usually get one or two. People love to use mullet for fish bait; uh, they're great at, for that. And uh, and then of course you can also occasionally catch the ones uh, that are for eating. But as we're going to learn in the course of the presentation, not all mullet are created equal. Uh, some mullet are preferred for eating over others. As a matter of fact, the one that I have pictured right here is what we would call a silver mullet and uh, because it lacks these black shades up here at the top. And uh, this would be one that you'd use for bait rather than for eating. This, these, uh, these silver mullet you would not want to eat. They just don't taste the same uh, if you ask somebody. All right, so this is a map. Uh, showing you the, uh, the distribution of mullet worldwide. As you can see, we're not alone in enjoying mullet. We have them right here, but they're also located here in, in the Antilles. We've got them all around Africa and Asia, all throughout the Indian Ocean here. And the, the geographic breadth of mullet is also reflected in the many names uh, that you have here. Mullet have lots of names all around the world. In Hawaii, they call them kahaha. Um, the Spanish have uh, the name Lisa or Lisa. Uh, you've got Papalvo. Uh, the Greeks, let's see if I've got the Greeks, the Greeks name here. They've got Cephalos, uh, the name for mullet there. There's just all kinds of different things that people call mullet all around the world. Now, locally uh, here in North Florida, mullet is considered a delicacy, but it doesn't necessarily enjoy that same reputation all around the world. Uh, we know from uh, historical and archaeological evidence that people have been eating mullet for thousands of years. Even the Romans ate mullet. Uh, they had a, a particular mullet over there called the red mullet or the spiny mullet, and that's the, the Romans would actually eat that uh, species of mullet in the Mediterranean. And yet, nowadays, if you were to do a survey around the United States and ask people what they thought about mullet as a food fish, most people would sort of screw up their noses and say, that's ridiculous. Mullet is a trash fish, only suitable as bait. Well, we got lucky. Here in the uh, Gulf waters of Florida, uh, we have what's, as I mentioned, locally known as black mullet, which is the species Mugilcephalus. I forgive, the, uh, please forgive the butchering of that pronunciation. Uh, but it actually does have a very tasty flavor and not quite as many bones as some of the other species of mullet that you can encounter out there in the waters of the planet. Um, and, and again, that's black mullet in, uh, as, as opposed to silver mullet, which is used for bait. But I would not ask you to take my word for it. Uh, there's no need for you to take my word for it because there is archaeological and historical evidence to show that mullet has been eaten by Floridians for literally thousands of years. So let's talk about how exactly that works. The best place to go if you're looking for evidence of Florida's millennia-long love of mullet uh, is Mound Key, uh, which is an island located in Estero Bay down here in southwest Florida between modern-day Fort Myers and Naples. And Mound Key is home to a very large archaeological preserve. This is down here. If you've ever been uh, to the Koreshian State Historical Area, that's located on the edge of Estero Bay, uh, the Koreshian Unity. We have the papers of the Koreshian Unity, by the way, at the State Archives. Uh, but they were a religious organization uh, that, that established an enclave down here in the Estero area. And they also owned part of Mound Key at one point. And, uh, and, and so that archaeological area is now part of a, a state park down there as well. And uh, what's so interesting about Mound Key is that there's this, um, it, it's covered, and I'm going to just, I didn't put a, a slide of Mound Key on the, on the thing here, but it's an island site shaped essentially like so. And one of its most interesting features is that it has this very large, clearly man-made canal. It's called, archaeologists call it the Grand Canal that goes across one part of the island. And then branching off of that canal 
are all of these smaller canals and, and what they call water courts. Water courts is the name that archeologists have given to them. And what these are, archeologists believe, is evidence of Florida's very first and earliest fish farms, okay? So you've got the Grand Canal here, you've got all of these, and, and what this is essentially, Mound Key was, a, was, uh, was originally inhabited uh, by, uh, by, by Native Americans at least a thousand years ago and quite possibly far farther beyond that, definitely pre-Columbian times. And the most famous residents, you might say, of Mound Key were the Calusa, uh, Calusa Indians. And these are the ones who Ponce de Leon met uh, when he first uh, arrived in Florida. Well, it's actually on his second voyage when he gets over uh, into, into this part of Florida uh, to try and establish a permanent colony. Remember, Ponce de Leon comes to Florida the first time in 1513 and uh, first sights Florida over on this side. But when he comes back in 1521 to try and establish a permanent settlement, he tries to do that over here. As a matter of fact, for a while, they called it the Bay of Ponce de Leon. I don't know if they still call it that down there. I think Estero Bay is still what you get in this area or Calusahatchee Bay or something like that. But anyway, uh, Old Ponce encountered Calusa Indians when he first arrived to try and start that permanent settlement. And they did get a chance to start unloading a few supplies and most famously some cows that are believed to be the origins of Florida Cracker cattle. But the Calusa were not exactly thrilled with the idea of these uh, white guys coming in and taking over their land. And so they actually turned on the Spanish pretty quickly after they arrived. And one of them actually managed to wound Ponce de Leon in, uh, uh, with an arrow. And, and so they ended up having to go back to Puerto Rico. And of course, Ponce de Leon dies. And that's the end of, of that, particular, uh, that particular attempt to colonize Florida in 1521. But those same Indians, uh, the Calusa, are famous for sort of building up this really interesting civilization on Mound Key. There's a whole series of shell middens. Those are sort of um, piles of, of shell and bone and, and other food refuse that they have here. And then fashioning with those middens and, and earthworks and things, these little, uh, these little water courts in here that are thought to be uh, places where they would actually herd fish or, or you know, possibly net fish from out here in the Gulf of Mexico and bring them in here to store them in these, uh, in these little water courts until they could, uh, until they needed to actually use them. And this form of, of food preservation, you know, even though they're preserving live food, we'll still call it food preservation, was extremely important because the Calusa were uh, hunter-gatherers uh, not so much farmers as some of their neighbors to the north, uh, but they were hunter-gatherers and they needed some place to be able to, to build up large stores of food because they had a lot on their plate at this time. Uh, the Calusa were, were certain, were, they were you know, building a lot of things in this area in terms of shell middens. They had a pretty complex society. And in order to, to have that complex society and to expand, they needed a good steady source of food. And archeologists believe that this, um, by having these water courts and actually storing all of this potential food fish in here, uh, that that helped to enable them uh, to, you know, that helped enable them to be able to do all of these complex things down here in Southwest Florida. Now, which food fish are we talking about? Once again, uh, looking at the archeological evidence, uh, and by the way, here, here's a picture of what these shell middens look like. And archeologists uh, love to, to dig down through these, look at the different strata, and they can use lots of different kinds of evidence that they encounter in different parts of the shell middens to understand exactly what's going on uh, in the course, over the course of uh, native habitation on the island. And so, you know, by looking in here, they can, they can carbon date, you know, some of the things that they find in here and they can run those tests in different parts of the island. And they can actually look at what life was like on Mount Key at different times. It's almost like the rings of a tree, if you think about that. Uh, the different strata within uh, shell middens can also tell you about how life changed over time. The stuff at the bottom is obviously the oldest, the stuff at the top is the most recent. And you know, based on the different things you find in the middens, you can tell a lot about that. Well, uh, most important for us this evening, uh, one of the things that, that is clear from the archeological evidence in those water courts 
in uh, on Mount Keith is that the Calusa were eating large numbers of herring, which I didn't realize we had herring off the Gulf Coast, but apparently we do. Herring, pinfish, and you guessed it, mullet. Mullet scales and mullet bones have been found in enormous quantities in those water courts and in the middens that surround them on Mound Key. So the next time you eat a plate of fried mullet or a, a, you know, a, a delicious dish of mullet dip, you can imagine that you are enjoying some of the same delicacies, maybe spiced up a little bit differently than the Calusa would have enjoyed them, but you are in, essentially partaking of a Florida tradition that goes back well more than a millennium. So let's uh, fast forward a little bit into the era of European conquest and the successive rule of the Spanish, uh, starting in the 16th century, then the British, and then the Spanish again for, for a few years, and then the Americans. All throughout that, we start seeing mullet once again. For example, if we look in the 1760s, uh, John Bartram, who was the, uh, the British botanist who visited Florida in the 1760s, he mentioned on a couple of different occasions during his travels, uh, seeing mullet. For example, uh, in the Salt Springs area up here in what's now the Ocala National Forest, uh, he mentioned seeing mullet among another, a number of other fish that he encountered there at Salt Springs. He mentions the mullet and mentions people using them uh, for, as a food fish. And, uh, and also, um, also he mentions the jumping, so we're, we can be pretty sure that he's talking about mullet because he talks about them actually coming up out of the water. And uh, that's interesting because nowadays freshwater mullet are not, are not particularly favored as a food fish, um, but apparently in those days uh, they, were, they were still, uh, see, well, of course they would have been seen at that time. Who, I'm not sure whether they were being eaten or not. However, there's something else that Bartram mentions about mullet that's interesting. And uh, he says that Native Americans would actually uh, herd mullet into canoes, which he may have confused that with nets, uh, but, but actually herded mullet into canoes using torches. Actually, maybe he meant they were, you know, getting them to actually jump into these canoes. I've, I've only read, uh, you know, sort of read the passage. Uh, but anyway, apparently uh, Native Americans were, were using mullet as a food fish in the 18th century, just as they were uh, a thousand years before with the Calusa farther south. Um, and, and if you think about it, this is not that far off from methods that would be used by European descended settlers later on down the line with seine nets and gill nets over on the Gulf Coast. Um, so it just, it just goes to show you mullet have always been sort of herdable uh, no matter which time period you're talking about. So let's uh, move on a little later into when the Americans take over Florida in 1821. Ooh, actually, let me, before we get on to that, I, I just want to read off just a little something here. Um, once, uh, once the Americans take over uh, Florida in 1821 and parts of the Gulf Coast that previously it had not been possible to really settle, as well as, as they had been during the Spanish or British colonial periods, uh, we start seeing mullet fisheries being reported all over the place. So for example, uh, in 1887, uh, the government put out a really big report on fisheries all along the Atlantic and, and Gulf Coast of the United States here. And they reported specifically mullet fisheries at Captiva Island, Charlotte Harbor, right down here, uh, Gasparilla Island, which is up a little closer to Tampa Bay, Sarasota, Pasigrill over here on this side of Tampa Bay, uh, Boca Sega, the Ancloat River, Crystal River up here a little bit farther, um, the mouth of the Suwannee um, up here, okay, the mouth of the Suwannee, uh, and Piney Point near Steen Hatchie, uh, the Finn Holloway River, which, you know, nowadays we, we know the Finn Holloway is as, uh, as having some pollution problems, so it may be a little difficult to think about uh, people eating fish so close to the mouth of the Finn Holloway, but in those days, of course, uh, that pollution didn't exist. So the Finn Holloway actually had a reputation for having really, really good uh, fishing grounds. In fact, the uh, Hampton Springs Hotel, which was uh, built around a mineral spring there in Taylor County, uh, they actually had a guest house down at the Gulf Coast, uh, right in here off the coast of Taylor County. And they had people from just all over the United States who would come down there to spend time hunting 
in the local woods and fishing in the waters of the Gulf of Mexico right off the mouth of the Finn Holloway, very different in those days. Uh, the Osceola River was reported to have a mullet fishery, Shell Point. Now that should be no surprise. People have been fishing uh, for mullet ever since then, of course, off of Shell Point and O'Clotney Bay. And some of the freshest mullet that you can get comes from that area. If you go down to Panacea, you know, to Angelo's or, or um, oh gosh, what's the name of the, the Posies and some of the other restaurants in that area, you just can't get any better uh, mullet than what they have in those places. Um, Destin, Apalachicola, and uh, even over as far as Pensacola, there were mullet fisheries reported. So, and that's just the Gulf side. I didn't even take a look at the Atlantic side, although I do know that there were some mullet fisheries on that side as well. But that's not the only mullet fishing that's going on in the 19th century. So all those that I named off, those were commercial fisheries where people were actually uh, catching the mullet, preserving the mullet, and then sending it on its way. There were markets in Havana that would purchase Florida mullet. There were, of course, lots of uh, general stores and, and different merchants inland that purchased uh, salt mullet or smoked mullet from, from uh, the fisheries along the coast. But in addition to that, uh, mullet actually furnished one of the earliest forms, uh, at least in the American era, of Florida tourism. So how exactly do you turn mullet fishing into tourism? Well, uh, let, me, let, me, let me explain. So uh, people in Georgia here, especially, you know, this, this, you know, maybe the western half of Georgia where access to the Atlantic coast was not as easy, uh, and maybe, you know, people didn't want to spend the money to have to stay, you know, on Tybee Island or, or, or maybe, you know, to stay at some established place with hotels and that sort of thing. People from Western Georgia and Alabama, and even as far north as the Carolinas and Tennessee, would oftentimes come down in, uh, in wagons, you know, just with their whole family, and would actually spend time along the Florida coastline which at that time was largely unpopulated, except for these few fisheries that we pointed out. And people would actually come down here and spend a month sometimes catching fish and preserving it and then taking it back up north for consumption back home. So it offered kind of a, a way to get away from the standard proteins that these people would be eating. It's not that fish were not available up in northern Georgia or Tennessee or the Carolinas, but mullet offered a very different kind of fish. Uh, and, and frankly, if you ask me, it's just a good way for these guys to, to get some vacation time for the family. Uh, although this was definitely a working vacation, uh, as, as we'll discuss here, uh, mullet fishing and preservation is a labor intensive process. And so this would not have been an opportunity to just kind of lay out in the Florida sun. These folks were working pretty hard uh, on this trip down to Florida. So we've got commercial fisheries, We've got private families and individuals coming down to Florida to catch mullet, but how exactly are they doing this? What exactly does mullet fishing and mullet preservation consist of? Well, the mullet fisheries uh, and, and definitely the private individuals as well in their turn, one of the most common methods uh, that was used at that time was, was seine netting. And the way this differs from like a, a cast net or a number of other nets that you may be familiar with is the purpose of seine netting is you actually take a boat and you take this, this net and you sort of go around, you watch for when the mullet are running is, is the term. If you, if you hang out around the coast very much and listen to the locals, you'll often hear them talking about whether or not the mullet are running at a particular time. And what this means is, is you know, when mullet are together in schools, they'll go up and down the coast, migrating in search of food and other places. Uh, and, and you can take advantage of this because if you can find schools of mullet that are moving in a particular direction, uh, then you can actually use your seine nets to kind of get a hold of them and sort of head them off at the pass and circle and circle them and then start dragging them back toward the shore. Or later on down the line, once boats get a little bit more sophisticated and have faster motors, you can actually move them towards a mullet boat. So what we're seeing in the picture right here, this is actually a relatively recent picture. This is 20th century, probably 1950s or 1960s. Uh, these are folks, I think this picture is actually taken off of Alligator Point, not too far from here, uh, where these people are, at, they've actually used a seine net, probably one end of it was attached to a boat. And so they would have 
uh, encircled a school of mullet, and then they would have slowly started bringing that net back into shore so that the mullet could be caught. Now, um, this became a little controversial down the line. Uh, seine netting uh, has gone through several different phases of regulation because you tend to catch a lot, uh, a lot more mullet than you can actually use in this process. And you also tend to catch a lot of other species, some of which uh, are restricted uh, and, and protected in various ways. And so seine netting is, is not used nowadays that often. People sometimes will use seine nets in like private ponds and things. Uh, to, um, uh, to, you know, to catch the fish that are in a pond to try and get rid of rough fish, uh, trash fish, that sort of thing. Uh, but seine netting for commercial mullet uh, is, is not what it used to be. Uh, now you can still see a legacy of this form of mullet fishing. For example, if any of you have ever been to the seine yard, uh, which is a, a restaurant, I think they've got one in the Pub Lake Yellow Public Shopping Center here in Tallahassee and then you've also got one, the original down in Woodville. Uh, that term, the seine yard, comes from the yard in which they would dry and repair seine nets, literally the seine net yard. Uh, and that's where the name of that restaurant comes from. You could also, you know, smaller people who were just small families that were coming down here to, to net mullet, they may not have had access to seine nets, and so they may have used uh, nets that are very similar to the cast nets that we see today. Uh, those nets are, are, you know, they were they were in use at that time period. This is a, a modern cast net. Again, this picture is probably taken in about the 1950s or so. Um, this is, of course, uh, a, you're not able to get quite as many mullet uh, as you would with the same net. Um, but this is uh, this is still used for food fish. Food. How would we put this? Food fish mullet catching <laughs> fishing. Uh, in, in those days and of course still used today. Uh, more commonly nowadays you see this used for people who are trying to get some silver mullet to go out and go fishing uh, out in deeper water where they can cut that mullet up and use it for cut bait. So, so here's uh, the next phase of if you're, if you're down either, if either you're a commercial fishery uh, that is on the uh, coast of Florida uh, with, you know, permanently set up, or if you're a family that is down in Florida, just kind of down for the month to try and catch some extra food to get it back home, both groups of people face a very difficult problem, particularly if you're catching this much mullet in a seine net, all right? This is an era without modern refrigeration. So how do you keep mullet uh, good to eat without, without having it spoil? There's two main solutions. Uh, that are that are proposed for this. There is a third one that's a little bit less popular. I'll leave that one for last because it's it is the least popular. And to me, I'm thinking, Ugh, I, don't, I don't know about that. But one of the most common methods, and this is probably the way that you all have encountered mullet most frequently. If if you're not down, you know, where you can get it fried, um, this is this is still a way that people uh, eat it even today. In fact, it's actually my favorite way to eat mullet, and that is to smoke it. And, you know, just like smoking any other meat, you would actually uh, just get it hooked on these little horseshoe-shaped hooks here. These, this photo was taken, I think this was taken at the Florida, uh, at the Florida Folk Festival where mullet, uh, mullet preservation was being demonstrated. It may have been taken elsewhere. By the way, you see these FloridaMemory.com links at the bottom of the screen. You can actually go to the full catalog record for almost any of the photos that we're using, except for the ones uh, that did not come from the state archives. And you can go to the full catalog record to get more information about each of these photos, where it came from, when it was taken, all that sort of thing. But what you're seeing here is mullet actually being smoked over a fire. And it's not just the smoke that's doing the trick. The smoke certainly helps, but the heat also helps to dry out all of the moisture uh, from the mullet, which then inhibits bacterial growth. And it allows you to actually pack the mullet up in barrels and you can carry it back to where you came from and, uh, and you won't have to worry about it spoiling. However, Smoking mullet, delicious as it is, it does impregnate the meat with a very delicious smoky flavor, uh, but it is not, it, the, the smoked mullet does not last as long as, oh, there's fried mullet. Um, let's see, I had another, I had, oh, maybe I don't have a, I may not have a picture of it. I don't think I have a picture of salting mullet, but the other method of preservation of mullet that's common at this time is actually salting mullet or brining mullet. 
And uh, this, with salting mullet, essentially what you would do, and, and I'm, I'm getting this from a description uh, from that same 1887 government report that listed all the mullet fisheries along the Gulf Coast of Florida. For salting mullet, you would essentially take and, and gut the fish uh, as you would if you were going to eat it fresh. But then instead of completely breaking the fish in, in half and then you know getting the fillets off of it, you would, after you got all the guts out, you would actually leave the fish almost with, with, with one side of it still shut. So it almost is like a hinge. And then you would pack the inside of that mullet with salt. And the salt would actually draw all the moisture out of the fish, the same way that the action of the smoke is doing in this method here. And then that would inhibit bacterial growth. And because salt in and of itself inhibits bacterial growth, as long as that salt is present in the fish, uh, then you would have the, the mullet preserved for much longer. Now, there, that of course does present a problem because if you have, uh, so if you've got all these casks of salted mullet, that's all very well and good. But when you go to eat it, uh, I don't know about you, but I can't eat something that's just completely covered in salt like that. And so uh, what, you, what you see folks doing is uh, when they want to actually eat some of this, they would soak it overnight uh, in, in water and perhaps change that water out a couple of times and the water would become progressively less salty and it would actually reinflate the meat a little bit because you know formerly the meat would tend to shrivel up because it had all that salt in it but once you put it in fresh water and then change the water out a couple of times it sort of reinflates the fish and you can actually eat it and look at this way you won't have to salt it it's already got a salty flavor to it still not as good as smoked mullet if you ask me the third option, the one that I sort of left for last, because I have to admit it's not one of my favorites, and that would be to brine or pickle mullet. Uh, now, before I get any groans from the audience, yes, I know there's people out here who swear by brined or pickled mullet. My father is among them. However, I have to tell you, I like my pickle, I like vegetables pickled. I don't know about, uh, and maybe even pickled eggs, but I don't know about pickled mullet. That's, that one's still not on my, on my radar. But I do know that that was, that was a method that was used to preserve mullet as well. Plenty of people uh, enjoyed that. So, let's see, um, continuing on. So as far as eating mullet goes in our modern, uh, in, in modern day stuff, um, you know, in the 19th century, mullet was used as, as a, a food fish just because it was really cheap and easy to get, um, you know, and, and, and it was very plentiful. Uh, now, as a, as a trade commodity, as I mentioned earlier, there is a mullet, uh, excuse me, there is a market for Florida mullet uh, as far south as Havana, Cuba, and of course, it's, you know, in demand in Florida and other, other parts of the southeast. Um, but I don't know exactly, and mullet fishermen of today would tell you that this has been an age-old problem with mullet. It's very, very plentiful, but by the law of supply and demand, uh, um, it's never been a particularly expensive fish, not like tuna and salmon and things like that. In 1887, uh, mullet only cost uh, in the neighborhood of two to three cents a pound. You could only sell it for two or three cents a pound. So as you can imagine, you would have to be a really serious mullet fisherman uh, to make much of a life out of mullet fishing on the Gulf Coast of the 1880s. Uh, and to be honest with you, uh, you know, whereas, you know, inflation causes so many other commodities to increase in price as we move forward into the 20th century, mullet barely budgets. The only thing that's going to make the mullet industry uh, worthwhile and profitable in the 20th century is if they can sell a greater volume of mullet by using modern refrigeration and that sort of thing. Uh, but we're going to see, uh, as we move a little later into the story here, uh, that that's not always going to be possible. Now, in the 20th century, uh, people start kind of experimenting with lots of different ways to eat mullet. Uh, as we can see with this young lady right here who's eating mullet at the, I think this is at the mullet festival, the annual mullet festival in Niceville. Um, fried mullet is definitely a, a favorite. Um, most of the restaurants that you find along the Gulf Coast in our area have delicious plates of fried mullet. I can personally vouch for the Seine Yard in Woodville. They've got some pretty good stuff on their menu uh, for pretty good fried mullet when they can get it. Uh, it's served with hush puppies, just in case you eat a bone or two, uh, grits, baked beans, all that kind of stuff. But, there are other ways and other parts of mullet to eat as well. Um, 
this, while it doesn't look particularly appetizing right here, what you're looking at here is the roe from the mullet, uh, which is the, the sacs of, of eggs that come from uh, a pregnant female mullet. Uh, these can be fried up the same as the rest of the fish. And again, while it doesn't look particularly appetizing, and it's usually difficult to get uh, people who are not from North Florida to try this, mullet roe, if you can find it and find it fresh, is absolutely delicious. However, I'll give you a fair warning. Don't eat too much of it. It has an effect, we'll say, an effect. Uh, so, uh, and, 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 and so uh, if you do eat, uh, decide to eat more than a couple of pieces of mullet row, that's fine. If it's something you really enjoy, just stay close to a bathroom. Um, smoked mullet, of course, is still a favorite and you will find that uh, the smoked mullet that we see here, one of the best ways that you see that uh, nowadays is in a dip, a smoked mullet dip, where they kind of combine it with some mayonnaise and cream cheese and spices. And some people put relish and some other things in it. Uh, but suffice it to say, something magical happens when you take smoked mullet and you combine it uh, with a little bit of mayonnaise and cream cheese and maybe a little bit of red paper, uh, pepper to, to spice it up. Just wonderful stuff. Now, um, so here's, uh, Here's kind of the transition point. The mullet industry has two really big enemies in the 20th century. Americans love fish, but they're very hard to get if you don't live near the coast. And so in the 20th century, we developed two key technologies uh, that, uh, that were perfected two technologies. This was being used to some extent before this, uh, that, that proved really difficult for the mullet industry. And that would be canned fish, especially tuna and salmon, and frozen fish especially white fish of different kinds, different kinds of white fish. So just because those technologies are around, that shouldn't mean that mullet was going to have a big problem. So why didn't mullet get a share in this new, uh, this new canned fish industry and this new frozen fish industry as they developed in the 20th century? The problem is its name. We are lucky here in North Florida to have a very delicious kind of mullet, the black mullet. But in many places around the United States, mullet was still considered a trash fish, even in the 20th century. And it's very, very hard to sell mullet to manufacturers to get it canned. In fact, with salmon and tuna and so many other fish on the market, in the 1960s, the price of mullet dropped so low that it almost was the same as the price was almost the same as it has been, uh, as it had been 100 years ago to two or three cents a pound. And that was starting to put mullet, uh, uh, commercial mullet fishermen out of business. Now this guy, who I've been trying to switch to his face several times, now it's time for this guy. William Randolph Hodges thought that he might have a plan to fix mullet's image and get the commercial mullet fishing industry in Florida back on its feet. This guy's name is William Randolph Hodges. He was the director of the State Board of Conservation, and he was also a native of Cedar Key, so no stranger to mullet or mullet fishermen. And he decided in the 1960s that mullet's problem was really a PR problem. There was nothing wrong with mullet. It was just its image. It needed a rebranding, so to speak, because there was plenty of market for mullet in Florida because us Floridians, we know that mullet tastes really good if you get it fresh, asterisk. However, people outside of Florida just did not want to buy mullet no matter what you did. So William Randolph Hodges got to thinking and he thought, hmm, well, what if it wasn't mullet that we were selling them? What if it was something else? And so he decided to come up with a new name. Now I'm gonna go ahead and tell you right now, I don't know how much time they spent thinking about this new name, but however much time it was, they didn't think long enough. Now, this is back to that graphic that I showed you earlier, and this is only a few. If, if you go, uh, the, the, the State Museum of Florida has a, a page where they've gone and they've actually named off like a hundred different names that mullet has around the world. And I like Hodge's idea. His idea was, look, mullet's not called just one thing. Mullet's around all over the world. There's lots and lots of names. We just need to pick a different name, maybe a little exotic name of some sort, you know, and, and we just need to pick a better name uh, that is going to uh, be more attractive to manufacturers for canning purposes, and that's going to be a little more attractive 
uh, for you know individuals to purchase on a supermarket uh, in, a, in a cooler at a supermarket. So out of all these different names, which one did they decide to pick? If you guessed Lisa, that probably would have been the last one you would guess, but if you guessed Lisa, that's exactly right. The State Board of Conservation launched an all-out campaign in the 1960s to rename Florida mullet Lisa. Huh. So why did they choose Lisa? Well, out of the 16, uh, 16 or so species of mullet that can be found in the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean Sea, uh, Lisa is the name that's most commonly used in Spanish-speaking countries, all right? So they figured, well, and, and it's, it's sometimes it's spelled L-I-Z-A, so it's Liza, you know, uh, that sort of thing. But they decided to go with the name Lisa. So the state jumped into action. State agencies started banning, uh, they, 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 uh, uh, state agencies were banned from using the word mullet. Uh, canners were encouraged to package the fish as Lisa rather than mullet. And, uh, you know, the State Board of Conservation did a lot of things during this time period to help prop up Florida seafood industries. Uh, and so, you know, they, they, they sort of used that as a leverage tool to get people to switch over uh, to the Lisa name instead of using mullet, which as you can imagine, a lot of mullet fishermen are scratching their head looking at, at William Randolph Hodges and saying, dude, <laughs> you're crazy. Uh, but, but some people did go along with it, but changing the name was not enough. Uh, the state had to actually get people to start eating Lisa in order to get it up off the ground. They needed some, some good press. They needed some good PR. Now, this is not, uh, you, know, you know, we don't live in a, uh, we don't live in a nation where the state can tell business what to do. However, the state can, in some cases, lead by example. So the state started injecting Lisa in every market that they could so that people would gain some experience with it. The state runs lots and lots of institutions that it pays for people to eat at those institutions. So <laughs> essentially, the state started serving Lisa on the menu at schools, hospitals, even the state prison in Rayford. So all of these folks, you know, people at the, the state hospital at Chattahoochee, the state prison at Rayford, school lunchrooms all across the United States, uh, excuse me, all across the state of Florida, all of them are starting to get dishes on their menus that included canned Lisa. The state also launched a nationwide campaign to get people eating Lisa by passing along recipes. If you've ever noticed the fresh from Florida folks at the Department of Agriculture who are the descendants of the State Board of Agriculture, anytime that they want to, uh, anytime that they want to promote a particular Florida food, they'll put out recipe cards. Uh, our, our two state chefs, Chef Bridget and Je Chef Justin at Fresh from Florida, they do an amazing job uh, promoting all kinds of different Flo Florida products and they show all these different recipes that you can use. Uh, the same thing, the same strategy was employed in trying to get Lisa up off the ground. And uh, <laughs> this is another one of those things where you really just have to laugh and say, really, did you think this was gonna work? because here are some of the recipes that the State Board of Conservation put out there attempting to appetize Floridians and people all around the United States to get them to eat Lisa. Lisa casserole, also sometimes called Lisa casserole supreme. So imagine tuna noodle casserole, uh, which is kind of common in, you know, in different places. Imagine that, but with mullet instead of tuna in there, okay? So you can, and, and look at this. We've got tomatoes in here, grated cheese, potatoes. This is definitely a 1960s recipe, okay? And by the way, if you're, if you're furiously scribbling on these, don't worry. Uh, we have these on the Florida Memory website. If you type in Lisa Casserole, you will find it. So don't worry uh, if you haven't finished reading it. I'm gonna move along for the sake of time. But yeah, Lisa Casserole, Lisa Luxury, loaf. <sighs> Lisa luxury loaf, which if you look at the ingredients, it's essentially, you know, breadcrumbs. We got tomato paste in here somewhere. Yeah, tomato paste. We got bell pepper. We're essentially looking at a meatloaf using mullet instead of beef. I don't know about all that. 
And then get this, this is my favorite. This is, if this, if, if nothing so far has turned your stomach, this might. Lisa guacamole. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry, I, I still think it's funny. The state of Florida actually attempted to back up this attempt to rename mullet as Lisa by getting people to mix canned mullet named Lisa into their guacamole. It was already hard enough to get people to eat avocados in the 1960s, unless they were Florida avocados, of course, uh, let alone try to get them to mix fish in with it. I mean, it's just absolutely crazy. They even, and this is just the beginning. These are the three that I thought would be the most interesting. Uh, but you've got Lisa Pilaf, you've got Lisa Melt Sandwiches, essentially a takeoff of tuna melt sandwiches. Absolutely crazy. Needless to say, the name never caught on and locals eventually went back to just calling it mullet. Many of them, I think I could argue on pretty solid ground, never stopped calling it mullet. Now, as for the commercial mullet industry, it continues to, uh, to, to serve, you know, it continues to serve Florida and parts of Alabama and Georgia. Uh, and, and, you know, it is still possible to be a commercial mullet fisherman. However, the number of commercial mullet fishermen has dropped considerably, not least because of changes in the rules regarding which nets you can use, but also because, let's face it, with mullet having the ongoing reputation as a trash fish across the United States, it's just hard to sell outside of Florida. However, I would argue that mullet, rather than being a commercial liability, is actually one of Florida's best kept secrets. Because I'm here to tell you, once you get yourself a taste of a really good bite of smoked mullet dip or fried mullet when it's really, really uh, fresh and well sourced, you'll, you'll, you'll understand why for thousands of years, mullet has been such a delicious staple. Mullet is so important to North Florida, even today, that there's even cultural events uh, designated just to celebrate mullet. For example, there is a mullet festival. Oops, I got ahead of myself. Uh, there is a mullet festival in Niceville every year. The, I think they call it the Boggy Bayou Mullet Festival over in Niceville. That's every October. I hope they're able to have it this year, properly socially distanced. Uh, not sure if that's going to happen or not, but that is normally held in October. <clears throat> in my hometown of Perry, Florida, down in Taylor County, we have the Florida Forest Festival every year in October, which includes the world's largest free fish fry. And the fish of choice, most of the time at that fish fry, has traditionally been mullet. And last but not least, perhaps one of the most bizarre and yet entertaining mullet-related cultural traditions is the annual interstate mullet toss, which is held in Perdido Key on the Florida-Alabama line. And what you're seeing here is a young man at the Florida Bama, and I, at the Florida Bama, and he is actually tossing a mullet from inside this 10-foot ring right here. You have to stand within the 10-foot ring. You can go wherever you want within that ring. And the idea is to see if you can toss a, a freshly caught mullet all the way across the Florida Alabama state line into Alabama. Are you up to the task? I hope that uh, once we're able to get out and travel a little bit more that some of you will consider going to Florida Alabama, if not to attempt the mullet toss yourself, at least to go and watch because it is an incredibly entertaining spectacle. All right, well folks, that is that is the program that I have planned for you today. I see that it's seven o'clock right on the dot, and I would be glad to take any questions by voice or by text. I have my text uh, panel right here, and I can take questions by voice as well. Um, I, Lacey, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Josh. Does anybody have any questions? You post. I'm still giggling over those recipes. I'm, it was hilarious. Oh, goodness. No questions? Oh, wait. Phyllis, you've got your hands up. You want to talk? You're unmuted, Phyllis. I can't hear you, Phyllis. 
Are they deboned? Are the are the uh, is the question whether the uh, the mullet that are being tossed deboned? No, eaten. When? Oh, oh, eaten. No, you can get mullet fillets, but but very commonly they're eaten on the bone. Some people will actually tell you that they taste better when the meat is on the bone. But you can get it filleted. I'm sort of a. Oh, sorry, I muted you in the middle of that, Phyllis. Angela, you have a question? I unmuted you, Angela. There you are. There you are. I was just going to say thank you very much to you and to Josh. They were very oh. interesting. Well, thank you. <laughs> Hi. Good job. Absolutely. Thank you. This is, we, we love, you know, this is a funny thing about the state archives is everybody thinks that we're all about just these very boring administrative government records and everything. But by the time you think about the fact that we have so many records from private families and businesses and individuals and, and so many records that document not just what government is doing, but how government is interacting with the public and solving all kinds of problems around the state and the photographic collection and film and all that stuff. I mean, the State Archives is in many ways the starting point for thousands of interesting stories, uh, even so bizarre as the attempted rebranding of mullet. <laughs> <laughs> and Josh and I joke, we kind of fight over collections, but um, since my museum is focused on, you know, Tallahassee and Northern uh, Florida, Northwest Florida history, I can, I can kind of get away with uh, getting collections that are more local than he can. So um, I tend to get some that are, uh, he may covet and then, then he gets some that I covet. So um, we kind of play off each other on the collections we get. So we fight for things. Anybody else? Oh, the uh, William wants you to go back to the mullet dip recipe slide. He wants to take a screenshot of it. Absolutely, it'll be my pleasure. And there will also be, here, here we go. There's the smoked mullet dip recipe. Now I have to, I have to say this, okay. Uh, there are lots of different recipes for smoked mullet dip. Virtually all of them are delicious, I'm sure. I have never, never in my life heard of putting celery in smoked mullet dip. I love celery. I love it in chicken salad. I love it in, in, in all uh, other kinds of lunch and salad. I've never heard of putting it in smoked mullet dip. This one actually comes from, remember I mentioned the Koresh and Unity uh, towards the beginning of the program that, you know, they had that uh, religious outpost there in Estero Bay. Uh, this, this recipe, and this is, the, uh, this is the link to it on Florida Memory, as I draw a line right through it. Uh, that's the link to it on Florida Memory. That, this recipe actually came from a cookbook that they put together back in the mid 20th century. They would do a cookbook periodically and they, they, they uh, uh, this came from the Koreshians, from somebody who contributed that. But uh, you'll find all kinds of delicious mullet dip recipes. Uh, if I had to, to send you to a really, really good one, I would say the State Library has a book of recipes that was put together by the Woman's Club of Apalachicola. And I gotta tell you, if I wanna go to somebody, you know, uh, to get a good seafood recipe, Apalachicola is the place to go. I mean, think about it. They're sort of the headquarters of Florida oystering, uh, <laughs> al along with other seafoods as well. They have a book there uh, in the State Library that's from the Woman's Club in Apalachicola, and they have an amazing mullet dip recipe in there that I would recommend as well. I don't have it on this slideshow, uh, but if, uh, if you're interested in that, I can certainly help you get your hands on that recipe. Okay. Uh, Ann Duncan, thank you. She said it was fascinating. And Christopher Cubitt, uh, thank you, Josh. I'll have to get my casting net out. Made me hungry for some smoked Lisa. <laughs> William says, fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, guys. Thank you.
Well, I enjoyed it. I don't know if we have any more questions. I think everybody really enjoyed it, Josh. You answered everybody's questions while you were talking. Good, good, good. And, uh, you know, this is just, again, we, we have uh, so many records that touch on so many aspects of Florida history and culture far beyond what's happening right here in Tallahassee. So, of course, we're very glad to, to try and help you with your genealogical questions, with historical community history questions. Uh, we're certainly glad to help you with all of that, even if your question is, you know, something like, why in the world did the state attempt to rename, rename one of its most common fish? <laughs> fish. <laughs> Yes. Um, if you have any further questions, you can always email me and I can get them to Josh at a later date. Um, um, oh, or, yes, you know, I have. Uh, there you go. <laughs> or sorry. contact him directly or the archives. And we will be here next week again, same time, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard. Um, our topic is going to be, I'm going to post it for you guys. Oh, did it not post? Hang on. There you go. Shipwrecks of Northwest Florida. And I've posted the link. Since we've had so many problems with our e-blast, there is a link to register. Um, so hopefully those of you can copy it. Um, but we'll be talking about the shipwrecks of Northwest Florida next week. And again, um, we always have the virtual tip jar available. I really appreciate all of you joining us every week um, that are repeat visitors and those new guys out there. We appreciate you too. Um, again, next week, Thursday, same time, same Zoom channel and we will see you then. Thank you so much, Josh. I really appreciate it, and I'm sure we'll be talking soon. I'm sure I've got some other thing to pick your brain about, but um, stay well, well pleasure, and everybody out there be safe. All right, take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.